we are fully now immersed in, uh, in multi-phase flow and we are going to see uh, first with what we have seen so far it, that there is a way that you have to be aware of that because not I think it's important that's the way um, many simulators reservoir simulators many engineers work with pressure drop in the tube using tables okay so I'm going to give you just a very short explanation so you know but actually your work is not to use you know tables was something that was used you know when we had problems with computational power we didn't have to evaluate didn't want to evaluate all of that all of these expressions complicated expressions so people made these tables and they used tables for everything but now we are in a new era digital era with excel everything and we don't need these tables but still they are used very much in many things that we use so many many software then we're going to talk just this is just for um, legacy issues pressure traverse curves curves I don't think I'm not sure if someone maybe uses it if you are remotely drilling for oil in the Tibet and you don't have access to a computer and you have an old manual with tiering tables and this is what these engineers might use but this is not used anymore so it's just I'm going to give you because there is something interesting how people did calculation before and then we're going to go deep into multi-phase flow theory the idea is that not that to make you an expert on multi-phase flow but at least that you know how to calculate what kind of methods do we have for multi-phase flow and what are the main definitions that you have to know uh, and then we are going to go to um, how to convert, remember, all the time we need velocity of liquid and gas at local conditions. And now we have a more complicated issue. We don't have only undersaturated oil or undersaturated gas, but we have actually the two phases. So we need to know how to make that conversion. And that will be, I think, let's see if we are, you know, if we manage to cover all of this today. Okay. But if you remember, what was the conclusion of last class, PWF? If I plot for multiphase versus rate, and this rate usually is the oil, if it's an oil well, or it could be gas if it's a gas well, oil or oil well, or Q of the gas for a gas well, which is kind of the primary product of this well. And how does it look like? Okay, I wake you in the middle of the night. And ask you how does it look like going down and going up, okay? And that's for a constant P wellhead pressure one, okay? So what people do is they say, well, let's put that in a table, okay? Let's convert that curve after we have already computed. And let's make it into a table so that's what we are going to use for our calculation so the table first has a header at the top that says pwh equal to pwh1 is for a fixed wellhead pressure and then in the table you have the q of the oil the q of the gas the q of the water in in the header and then you have PWF and you have also T wellhead <clears throat> and you might have some other things but that's mainly the main information you have okay so it's like they took each one of these points and they let's use another color and they bring it and they put it here that point will be for zero this point will be for and something else and so forth yeah you put it in a table form and that's, you know, you think, okay, why is that? Why not just to go and compute? You take the rate and you have the wellhead pressure and then you compute countercurrent, the, the pressure drop. But that's what I'm saying that it took, you know, in the, maybe in the 70s, 80s, it took a lot of time and computational power to do it. And it was very time expensive. So people did it beforehand at the office. They generated a bunch of tables. And then they gave it to anyone that wanted to use, you know, wanted to run calculations on this well. The problem is that, for example, if you have a well, okay, the case that we have always discussed, if we have a well, 
and that well is relatively close to the separator and has an open choke, then we can assume, yes, that well is operating with constant wellhead pressure. But if you start to change the choke, or if that well is part of a network, remember what I told you about networks, like you have a series of, of wells okay, that are producing, and at the end you have here the separator. For example, if these wells start producing more, or these wells start producing more, then it will be a bigger pressure drop from the separator, okay, because that line will carry more liquid, and then ultimately you will have a higher wellhead pressure. So in those cases, the wellhead pressure is not constant. So to be consistent, what people do is that they say, well, I have to make a table for different wellhead pressures. We'll have pressure one, we'll have pressure two, and we'll have pressure three. Okay? And so forth. And you have to decide how many how many points you want. And for example, if you're going to say we'll let's say wellhead pressure can change any any place between Static wellhead pressure, that means when is the well is fully closed, or separator pressure. And let's say that's, you know, maybe 300 or 200 bar all the way to separator pressure, which is 30 bar. Okay? So in that case, the P, P wellhead range, you have to generate tables for the range between 200 bar all the way to 30 bar. Okay? And you can choose how many points you want in this table, okay? You can choose to do it in one go, so you can choose to have only one table for 200 and one for 30 and to interpolate. The problem is that, remember, all of these curves, they are very, you know, basically what you're doing is you have another set of, another wellhead pressure here, another wellhead pressure here, okay? That will be P wellhead pressure two, P wellhead pressure three, so basically, you have to interpolate between these two. And it might not be linear, the, the relationship with, with wellhead pressure. Okay, probably it's not linear because it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a nonlinear equation. It has this friction and it has all kind of ugly things inside. So the best is to take a good interval between them, maybe every 20 bar, and then you have to make a lot of points. You have to make a lot of tables for different wellhead pressures, such that when you interpolate, for example, you want for, if I want the, the, the for example, the, um, the curve for wellhead pressure to uh, 185, let's say that you have one curve that is PWH for 180 and another curve PWH 170, and you can make a really good interpolation between them. Okay? It's not the same than to have an interpolation with 200 okay, and 30. Because then probably the interpolation will be a bit poor. Okay? So that's one complexity. And then the other complexity is that also, remember, this curve was for a gas-liquid ratio equal fixed. Okay? But actually what happens with time... If you remember your reservoir classes, the gas-liquid ratio, how does it look like with time? Or the GOR, how does it look like with time? For solution gas drive reservoirs, it looks something like that, and then it goes up, and then it goes down, right? Yes, you see this, this shape. So that means that the GOR is going to change with time. That means that if you want to have you need to have, if you want to have a model to cover the whole life of the field, you have to do variations also with GOR. Okay? And also, the water cut, if we put here an axis now, that's the water cut. It also usually goes from zero or maybe close to zero, you know, it goes all the way maybe to 80 or 90% of water cut. So you have two other variables besides wellhead pressure. So then you have to say, then you have to have these tables, okay, the same that I had from before.
but now we have I'm just you know I like I make this to, to bump the page with you know useful or the same information just to that you that you get it that is uh, so this is for GOR1 and GOR1 and GOR1 okay and maybe water cut one water cut one and water cut one but then you come here and then you have for GOR2 but for the same water cut water cut one GOR2 water cut one and GOR2 water cut one and then for example if you have three GORs then you have GOR3 water cut one GOR3 water cut one GOR3 water cut one and then you have to do the same for water cut two and three okay a big job okay let me just put it smaller and I we will make it in the next page you know it's not because I want to take space from the page but also you realize the complexity that it becomes if you have only a few variables then the table becomes huge very very quickly because you have to make the combination between all of them after you have that you will have for example Okay, one for water cut two, and you will have one for water cut three. Okay, like I said, I'm not trying to bomb your your notes, but it's just that you get the um okay, so we had one for water cut one. Now we need water cut two. Again, you have then water cut three. Okay, we're going now, just this is to, to make a point. And then uh, we are going to go to one more general expression that you can use. Okay, so you see that we cover all cases. We have three water cuts, we have three GORs, and we have three wellhead pressures. So that gave you how many how many tables? Huh? So that gives you okay. So number of cases, number of tables, number of tables. is number of wellhead pressures times the number of GORs times the number of um, water cuts, okay? So that gives you, in this case, we have three, okay? In our particular case, that gives you 27 tables. That's exactly what we have here. Yes, no? But now remember, every table has a certain number of rates. Okay, so I have to run these 27 cases times, so number of simulations per table. Okay, for example, here I might have maybe 10 rates. Okay, so this is 10. So at the end, to make this table with only three wellhead pressure, three GORs, and three water cuts, I have to make 270 evaluations or simulations or calculations. Okay. of uh, delta P in the tubing, okay? That clear? And usually a good number, you want to use at least maybe 10 or 20 points for each, and then it can blow up very, very quick. Okay, you increase here, you put 20, 20, 20, and then you have 20 here, it will be a huge amount of, of number. Now, I'm not saying that this is not used. This is what people use in Reservoir Simulator. Reservoir Simulator, they don't want to go to your Excel sheet to ask you 
please, you know, uh, make the calculation for me. They want to have a table that they can run it automatically, make interpolation on the table. So Reservoir Simulator is using this. Reservoir Simulator uses tables. And also, there are some production simulators that use tables, like, for example, GAP. Okay, GAP uses tables for wells. Okay, GAP uses, it makes calculation live for anything else, for pipes, for pumps, for everything. But if you have for wells, usually it's using the, the tables. Okay, because it's saying that it's much quicker to run. So just one comment here, be careful if you use tables. Use an appropriate number of points. Of points to ensure a good interpolation. Okay, be, be sure if you're ever, because probably when you are in production or if you're working with uh, also in, in reservoir, you are going to be asked to generate this table. You say, oh, you took this course with, with Milan five years ago, so please generate the tables for me, so keep that in mind. Okay, that's exactly what it's doing, recording this curve, all points in the curve, and then you have to, co to, to take care of all possible cases. Okay. Yes. So now we want to talk about. Uh, so that that one is finished. Let's talk about pressure traverse curves. Okay. And this was a technique that actually is a graphical method to solve a, a pressure drop calculations in in. Uh, in um, in oil wells. In vertical oil wells. Okay. <clears throat> and basically the observation was the following. The observation was that if you have a well And here you have this wellhead pressure. Okay. If you left everything constant, okay, you left a rate, so rate is constant, um, the inclination of the well is constant then the gas-liquid ratio is constant, then the characteristics of the fluid are constant. Okay, you don't change anything. The only thing that you're going to change is the wellhead pressure. Okay, so I'm going to make a plot of the pressure. This is pressure here, and this is TVD, okay, through vertical depth. And let's say I start with a pressure of, for example, 30 bar. Okay, and then I, I go and I measure and I compute and it will do something like this. Okay, the pressure is increasing and at the end, at the bottom of the tubing here, this is the bottom hole. I have it like that. Okay, now let's say that we change it and we put it to 50 now. Okay, now we say 50. And it's going to go also in a, in a similar way. Okay. But the thing is here, okay, here, uh, okay, so let me, so if you go, now be careful with this part. If you go and the, in this curve, this point will have 50, right? Yes, the other curve, this 30 bar. Okay, so if you come and you put this curve one exactly on top of this one, they will be identical. Identical, which is, I didn't put it here, but uh, let me make a trick. I will say that this, like that, 
Okay? So if I, that's, that's the curve, that's the experiment I made with every, all of that constant. What, I say, what I'm saying is that I change the wellhead pressure. Okay? The wellhead pressure, this is wellhead pressure. In one case is 30, and the other case is 50. Now what I'm saying, if I take the curve and I put it exactly on top of this one, when it has the same pressure, the two curves must fall one on top of the other. That means that gradient, okay, it's also why they are called also gradient curves, the gradient dp over d z, okay, where z is the depth, is just a function, for this case, just a function of pressure. That means if I have the same pressure in the tubing, okay, if I have, for example, 50 here or 50 here or 50 here, they will have the same, exactly the same gradient. Okay? That clear? Yes? They you Okay. So now with that in mind, okay, let's see how this method works. This, um, let, you know, I gave you um, a, a PDF, a, a PowerPoint. This was... Um, some guys teaching this course from, from Tulsa, a professor called Mauricio Prado. He had these uh, slides. But so that's what we are going to use. So we have that curve, okay? And they have decided for different... So let's see here, what do they have? This is like a class exercise. So I'm going to make one myself, and then you're going to make another one. So you understand, okay? Like you see here, we have exactly the same, the pressure, in times 100. So this is 2,000 PSI, 28,000 PSI, and so forth, okay? All of them are centered in zero. And we have a very long 20,000 feet uh, tubing, okay? That's a very, really, very long well. And I, here I have different curves for different uh, GORs, okay? These are, well, actually, G gas liquid ratio okay so the question is that you have with this curve you are provided with this information remember this is for a fixed rate okay the liquid rate is fixed is a thousand the tubing size so is also fixed the gravity of the oil gravity of the gas the gravity of the water if there is any water and the temperature is also fixed everything is fixed in this curve okay the only thing that is not fixed is the is you know the this is plotting what happens with pressure when when you go deeper and deeper. And this is horizontal uh, vertical well. Okay, so let's see here. So use let's let's take exactly that. I think that example was uh, nice. Okay, it says. Use this pressure traverse curve from the textbook to determine wellhead pressure. So in this case, I'm moving from bottom hole to wellhead. For the following production, okay, bottom hole flowing pressure, 25,000 PSI. Well depth is 9,000 feet. And here we have 20,000, okay. And a tubing size 2441, that's exactly what we have. Uh, oil liquid rate is a thousand standard barrels per day. Water cut is uh, 50 percent. That's a fraction, so it's okay. So this curve is exactly, and the gas liquid ratio is 400. Okay, so we are talking about this curve here. Yes. So first, I have to identify which curve I need. Which curve? I'm with. All the others now, I, they, I don't care, because the gas liquid ratio. So I'm going to ask you, is it constant or not along the tubing? It's constant because this gas-liquid ratio is expressed on, let's see the units, okay? Gas-liquid ratio is, see them here, is the Q of the gas with a bar on top divided by the Q of the oil plus the Q of the water with a bar on top. Now I ask you, is this one changing along the tubing? Is this one changing? This one changing? No. So it so shouldn't change. It should be constant along the tube. Okay? So then, remember, the gradient is only a function of pressure. Nothing else. It's only a function of pressure. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go, we always go from the point that we know. 
okay, which is 2,500 psi, and okay, so I first locate 2,500 psi in this diagram. So 24, uh, it will be someplace here, okay. I go down until I cross the curve with 400, okay, which will be maybe here, yes. I know the DP here is true. That's the DP I will have, the DP DZ. That's the pressure gradient I will have. And that's at the bottom of the tubing, okay? Don't care that here you have another depth, okay? Don't, don't pay attention to that, okay? That was done for a generic world. Don't pay attention. Now, what I'm going to do, I say, well, if the gradient here is the same, it's going to keep exactly the same when I'm moving up, then the only thing I have to do is to count 9,000 feet up, Okay, so I go, how, how much is 1,000 feet up, uh, 9,000 feet up, that's the length, the depth of the well, so that will be around um, here maybe, yes, and then I go and I cross with this curve and I obtain the pressure which is around 40 PSIG, finish, okay. So that's how you use, you use that curve. First, you, you say, remember this big, big conclusion. If I leave everything constant, everything in constant. Ray, uh, uh, density, specific density of oil, specific density of gas, gas-liquid ratio, etc. The delta P is only a function of the pressure. Mm -hmm. So I come first and locate the pressure that I have. Okay. Uh, the pressure that I have, I locate it here, and I say, well, that's the pressure I have, and that's at the bottom of the tubing. Then I go, and then I go up, because I, I'm moving up, okay, I'm at the bottom of the tubing, and then I go to the wellhead, 9,000 feet, the length of my well, okay, and then I, again, on the same curve, that will have the same gradient, I go and I read the pressure, and it will be that that's the wellhead pressure. Okay? Now, you see, what is the disadvantage of this method? First, if I have a tubing with another rate, the same tubing with a different rate, doesn't work. Okay? Now, if I have a tubing with a different uh, water fraction, doesn't work. Now, if I have a tubing that is inclined, okay, or is made with different a straight vertical then deviated etc doesn't work okay so this only works for vertical wells and if you keep everything the constant and you have to be lucky enough that you find exactly one table that has the specs that your well has okay so that's why we went away from this method as computers become faster engineers become more smart to program expressions now you don't have to use these curves anymore but if you're trapped I don't know, you went someplace in the north and then you're no electricity, uh, uh, crocodile ate your computer and you have your boss is asking, tell me how, what, is, what pressure do I have to put to get this rate? You go and find very quickly in some old manual, you find this uh, and you calculate using them. Okay, so now let's, now that I did and I showed you, now we have to make, so an another question, what happens if if my, my, the length is, for example, 12,000, okay, or more, more than this distance, okay, is 13,000, the depth. Do I, I just, uh, do I have to find another table or what? Can I produce this well or not? Well, let's say you will need, if we extrapolate, okay, we say here, you will need, that means if you put zero vacuum, okay, if you put atmospheric pressure, you can flow the flow at 1,000 rate only up to this point. To have something below that, you will need a negative pressure, okay, you will need like a vacuum, 
which is not possible unless you put a compressor or something. So your conclusion in that case, if the length and you end up with a point here, you will need a pressure lower than atmospheric pressure. That means that that rate that you want to flow is not possible to flow. Okay, because you already reach the lowest pressure that that you can reach at the at the, at the depth, you know, not yet close, not yet close to the well. Okay, so let's make an exercise, and now you try, you know, let's you will do the second one, okay, and that's the opposite. You have wellhead pressure, you have well depth, and then you have to calculate what will be the pressure uh, at the bottom. Okay, so please do it on your computers um, and try to find and give me the, the number for pressure. Okay, so we did that example. And you did the other example, which was nice. And now we go and going to submerge ourselves in, a, you know, to really, because so far we're looking at it from outside, okay? We're looking how the curve looks like, the points, and we are looking at the tubing as a unit, okay? That you have P out and P in. And we're trying to look all kind of things, what happened with this P in, P out. But now actually we're going to look inside and see how do we calculate pressure along this tubing. That's what we want to do at the end, okay? Exactly what we have done for gas. We are not happy just to know the curve looks like that. We want to know how to compute this curve. So remember what we have done for, you know, what we have done for for single phase, okay, we did a, a graph that was F and was Reynolds, right? That's what we did to compute losses for a single phase. And then those like that, like that, yes. Now, this procedure, it's a bit tricky to make it for multi-phase. Basically, this is one approach, and we are going to talk about a bit later, but one approach is just to say, I find some a dimensional number, so this is a dimensional delta P, and that's a dimensional velocity, and I find, run many, many experiments, and then I find a trend, a very nice trend, and I tune an equation, I tune something to it, okay? That might be an approach. In multi-phase flow, so let's see, we create two numbers that are like this what, this guy here, okay? Remember, we have two phases, okay? We have liquid and we have gas. So we're going to say we're going to create like an dimensional velocity for each one of the phases, okay? And these are going to be what I call, what, what, is, what they are known as superficial velocity. Did I put the recording again? Okay, it's like, you can think about it, it's not really a dimensional, okay, but it's the, it's the, it's not really a dimensional, but it's like a, an a dimensional velocity. Okay, so here we have Q velocity, superficial velocity, we're going to define it as USL. Okay. That will be the rate of liquid divided by area. That's the cross-section area of the pipe. And this is um, a, the local volume rate. Okay, That means at pressure and temperature that I want. And then I have USG equal to Q of the gas divided by the cross-section area. I create these two numbers, okay? They are not enough. We will see now that they are, I, I, it's much more complicated than just using these two numbers. But we will see something very nice that we can make with these two numbers. With these two numbers, I can make flow pattern maps. Okay. And that looks like something like this. If I plot USL and I plot here USG, okay, the two superficial velocities, and everything else I leave constant. Okay, everything else is constant.
that means the density of the liquid, the density of the gas, the inclination of the pipe, the roughness, the uh, surface tension between liquid and gas, uh, viscosity of gas, viscosity of liquid, everything else. I leave everything else fixed. Then I will see, and this is log log, okay? Let's see, and this is for a horizontal line. that I will find exactly that some flow patterns, I told you last, last, you remember, right? What flow patterns were. It's like a different ways how the phases are arranged in the pipe. I can have bubble, annular, all of that, right? So I can say, define really some very nice areas where these flow patterns occur. Okay, something like this. So I hope it's not, uh, let me bring it down. Okay, this is like this. And another one here. So to be a closer. And it defines the following. It defines that map. It roughly looks like that, okay? And we have here, when we are using low gas speeds and low liquid speeds, okay, or low rates, this is, um, what did I have here? Low, low, okay, low. Here we have stratified flow, okay? If we have low gas speeds and low uh, liquid speeds, that means stratified flow is that if we have the pipe and we have the liquid is stratified exactly at the base, at the bottom, and then we have gas flowing at the top. Okay? That's stratified flow. I have it there. Now, if I keep if I if I keep increasing the um, if I keep increasing the gas velocity, that means I start moving on that direction. I get here stratified wavy. Okay, and stratified wavy. Okay, we are you know I'm, I'm going starting with horizontal because I think it has like more more flow patterns, but then we go to vertical and some of them, this stratified actually doesn't exist, okay? But I think just to give you the full picture. So then you start having that the liquid starting to have some peaks and some, some waves, okay? The interface is not only very flat, but it's starting to have all of these um, because it's like the gas is like it's blowing, okay? It's like gas blowing on the ocean, like the air blowing on the ocean. It's creating, because it has more speed, then it can create some, some, some waves. Mm -hmm. Then if we continue, we go all the way to annular. Okay, an annular, you already know how it looks like. Basically, that's annular. Where you have, like, um, you know, close to the wall, you have a thin film, or it can be thin, or it can be a bit thicker, but it usually it's thin. And then you have gas flowing through the center. Of course, due to gravity, this film, this thickness is going to be greater than the one at the top. Okay, and then you have maybe some droplets here. Now, if we now are in stratified and we increase the amount of liquid, okay, you will find what is called bubble. Things with two Bs. Bubble flow. Okay, and bubble looks something like this.
And you can have big bubbles or small bubbles, but basically is some some bubbles, and they're going to be maybe you know um, some some of them might be even a bit um, a bit bigger. You might have starting some kind of something like that. And then if you continue increasing the velocity of liquid, then you're going to have here this first bubble, which basically is very similar to bubble, but it has a lot of small, they are much smaller, and there is a lot of mixing. There is a lot of turbulence. On this one, you can almost see like tracking each bubble, it goes by itself, very quiet. But when I start increasing, then it becomes the bubbles start to move very much in the channel, okay, in the in the pipe. Okay, disperse bubble. And now we are missing some some strange thing there, okay? And that one is the enemy or the devil of all flow patterns, which is called slug, okay, slug flow. That we don't want. We can operate in all the rest, don't care, but when it comes to slug, we really, production in years, we kind of sweat when we, when we talk about slug, okay? And we have to live with it. Remember how slug was? Slug was actually, it had a very big, Okay, something like this, some droplets. So you have intermittent batches of liquid and gas. And that is very bad for different reasons, but one of them, it requires more pressure drop. Also, if you start having a separator and if you get batches slug flow, okay, liquid, gas, liquid, gas, if this, this distance is small, then I'm okay. But if that distance, let's say, is a, a considerable volume, then I have that the volume will increase and decrease dramatically in the separator. Okay, and also it creates vibration to my structures, to my to my structures. Okay, so that's how the map looks like for horizontal flow, and that's all the different flow patterns. And let's see how the map looks like for vertical flow. So horizontal, let me just highlight it here. And leaving everything else fixed, okay? For vertical pipe, okay? Then I have to do exactly the same thing, and you are going to do an exercise after the break on that. USL, USG, and here we have Again, a thin line here saying dispersed bubble. Here, actually, we don't have any more um, stratified, okay, because the stratification was made just by the gravity. And now gravity is just opposite to the flow, okay? So here we just have, are going to have bubble. And here we have, then we have something like this and something like that, and here we have slug, and here we have churn, and here we have annular, okay? I'm not going to talk about the other so much because you already know how it should look like. Dispersed, it's a very small uh, bubbles of gas, okay, that they move and there is a lot of turbulence and a lot of uh, movement between them. Then you have this bubble where bubbles are actually almost very nice, very nice to each other, and they go slow up. You might have even a small plug like that. Then you have this devil that looks lock flow. I'm going to show you some videos just now before the break. It's log flow. Remember, I have a big plug. 
and we have a, um, some water plug behind and then I have churn okay with churn is a bit strange churn is if I continue increasing the gas velocity on slope flow you don't you lose like this batch these nice batches of liquid and gas but they start becoming like a strange structure like uh, like this they start like some blobs okay that they are maybe a bit longer in volume but they are not so nicely distributed churn and then we have the last one which is annular and annular something like this And if you continue, you find annular, also you find mist. Yes? Okay, so that's uh, a dispersed bubble. That's bubble. That's a slug. That's churn. And that's um, annular. And that churn actually had the name. The churn, I think, is what you the what you make to make uh, butter. You know, to make butter, you have to heat uh, uh, the mix several times, and you end up with some kind of a blob like that. So that's where they came with the name. Okay, churn. And let me show you some some fig, some um, some videos to see what do we have here. Okay, which flow pattern is that? No, not really, it's, um, it's annular, okay? The only thing is that you see here, it's like the liquid is waiting the whole wall, okay, and it has a core in the center where the gas is going. So that's annular. Let's see another one. So which one is that? Bubble. Bubble. Okay, they go very nice, very slow. Don't don't mix between them. Let's see this one. Also some bubble, but you still you're starting to have some some bigger some slugs. Okay, but it's like it will be like bubble flow. This one. That's log. Okay. You get batches of gas and batches of liquid. Okay. Uh, should we take a break? Yes? Okay. So we take a break 20 minutes. Okay. We continue then. So the map is not so important that you you know, to you draw it yourself, but the main point is that for different combinations of superficial, and remember this is local rate divided by cross section area of the pipe, and it's like an adimensional number. It's not a dimensional because this has units of velocity actually. This is meters per second. Also this one. But uh, it tells you that if you keep everything else constant, which is not the case, then you find a very nice map that you have is very, you know, you can, if you have this combination, you have bubble. If you have this combination, you have stratify and so forth. And you see more or less what each, pa each flow pattern uh, means. Now, we go to the issue that, you know, actually, it is very difficult to use just these two numbers because you have too many things like... Uh, you have a Reynolds number for the liquid, a Reynolds number for the gas. Okay. You have also what you call the, the Weber number. Okay, that the Weber number, it's, um, is the ratio of 
density times velocity squared divided by sigma times the diameter. And that's like, you know, this Reynolds is measuring inertia with respect to, uh, to viscosity, okay, to viscous. This one is also inertia. This is very important for droplets and inertia that is trying to tear the droplet apart and this surface tension that is trying to keep the droplet or the bubble uh, together, okay? And then you have, so you have one for the liquid, one for the gas, and you have also this fruit number. That's what you use in channels. If you have any course in channels, velocity and gravitational force, that's very important for stratified, where you have the inertia is like trying to destabilize, to create these waves, okay? while the, the gravity is trying to separate fluids. Okay. So you have the, the conclusion here is that you have many, many different dimensional numbers because you have two phases. And if you consider also water, then you have three phases, water, oil, and gas. And then to create correlation is like you have multidimensional is a nightmare. It's called like the curse of multidimensional. Okay. You cannot do it for only one thing. And that's still an issue of research and many people working on it and people think we are never going to find a solution, but um, let, let's see. Okay, but the thing is that the, in regarding the flow patterns, you have like two very clear, or if we, you know, and also be aware that to classify a flow pattern, for example, might be that this bubble looks very close to a slug. Okay, so how do you classify these two? or this churn looks very close to slug. So where do you put the point? Do you put it to slug or do you put it to churn? Also here, is it really wavy or not so much? So the, these boundaries really are, sometimes are very easy to see. They change one to the other, but sometimes they change very gradually. So it's up to the researcher to say, okay, here, this is stratified, this is uh, wavy, for example, or onion, okay? Yes? If we have a very different amount in the fight, how to classify it? Well, you have, uh, besides from these ones, these are like the main, the, the, the basics. But you have some researchers that they created even 20 flow patterns, different things, like uh, a stratified with some droplets. Stratified with waves this size, stratified with big waves, uh, this one. So they have inside each one of them you can find, but that's not so important. Just, you know, we are, we are going to use, this is going to show you how they arrange themselves, but at the end, remember what we want is pressure probe. Okay, so I'm going to try to show you how this is used for calculating pressure probe. Okay. <clears throat> and you can really see like two things. Okay, you have separated flow regimes, okay, where you have basically stratified, and you have annular flow, and the annular flow, we make it here, oh, sorry, to, I didn't say, but incline, if you're very close to vertical, it will look, the map will look very similar to this one, okay? Horizontal, on the other hand, if you're very close to horizontal, the map can change completely, okay? But that, we are, we are looking now, we're focusing more on the vertical because that's what we want is for the tubing, okay? The other is for transportation lines, but I think you want to focus this on, on tubing. Okay, annular, it's also separated. And this is, so the transition between these two is very relatively what you could say gradual, okay? It's like you increase the superficial velocity of the gas and it's a gradual transition. Let me put it here. And then we have some mixed flow regimes, mixed flow regimes that um, they are, for example, a uh, bubble. And 
And then when we start increasing, this is because everything is mixed. And when we start increasing, then we get uh, this log. Okay, I'm going to put just the names here, so slug and bubble and stratified and uh, this is annular, this should be stratified, while so the transition between them, between the same kind of mixed and the same separated is very gradual. You increase the gas and then slowly, slowly it's going to change from here to here and that's where you have problems defining the bound. But when you change from here to here, it's usually very abrupt. Okay, you can see that it marks very well when you start increasing then it becomes unstable and it will change to, to the other flow pattern. Okay, so this transition here in this direction is very abrupt transition. Repentina. Okay. Now, what defines this transition? So basically, we have inside these two fluids, we have some forces, okay, acting on on the different things, on the gas and on the liquid. That we have forces that are stabilizing, are separating, and we have forces that are dispersing, that are trying to shear these two fluids. So we have so the the, the uh, transition. And um, we we'll say it's uh, the um, the occurrence of flow patterns is dictated by an force equilibrium. on the face. Okay. And of course you have different forces, but you have forces that are um, separating force. Okay, like for example, here you have a gravitational acceleration. Okay. What else you have? You have also this surface tension, okay? This um, surface forces, surface forces, and then you have forces that are so. This is not really separating, but it's segregating, okay? That they want to segregate the face, segregating forces, and then you have a mixing forces. And here you have, for example, inertia, okay, or velocity squared. And you have, um, what else? Well, also here you have uh, viscosity, okay. Viscosity sometimes can be, can play both actually. Okay. It can be a mixing force or it can be a stabilizing, a segregating force. So you have all the time in each phase, you have the, four, the two forces, and depending on the magnitude of these dimensional numbers that I showed before, Weber, fruit, etc., you will tend to be in one flow pattern or in the other flow pattern. Okay, so that's why maybe it looks like that. For a certain viscosity, you change the viscosity of the fluid, and then the boundary changes completely. Okay, because not anymore you have slug, you have, for example, you have a very viscous fluid, and then the slug becomes, the area becomes very small because then it's more stable. The bubbles can, you know, form and they are uh, like uh, more likely to happen. That clear? Yes, okay. So we will see now how this affects, uh, because at the end, you know, we will see that there are different methods to deal with this, but just like I will give you a, a, like a heads up. 
If you look at here, you see if you want to calculate friction, okay, friction losses, here you have that actually the wetting phase is liquid and here you have the wetting phase is gas. So what you have to do is to define how much of the cross section of the area is occupied by gas and how much is occupied by liquid, okay, to compute the friction in the wall, okay, mm -hmm. and to compute pressure growth. In this one here, well, everything is wetted by the by the liquid, but you have maybe a very strong interfacial uh, is, uh, sh uh, friction. Okay, in this one, liquid is wetting everything. In this one, it's like a combination. You have sometimes it's liquid, sometimes it's, it's gas. So the calculation of the pressure drop depends very much on the flow pattern. That's the conclusion. So that's why we want to, you will see when we make calculations in the pipe, we, we, we usually want to know the flow pattern. Now let's make uh, an exercise that you have, and you're going to do it yourself. So what we want to say is we want to calculate basically, remember this map depends on the properties. What will happen when we flow along the tubing is that the properties will change, right? But we are going to assume well, they, are, they don't change that much, okay? We can use the same map for every point in the tubing, okay? So what I have given you is a file. So this is a class exercise. And the purpose of this class exercise is to uh, uh, define the flow patterns in the tubing, along the tubing. Okay. I told you that, uh, you know, I show you, but you don't have to believe me, okay? You have to do it yourself. I show you that it can change from undersaturated, then you go to bubble, then you go to annular, slug, etc. Okay, but now you're going to do it yourself and actually see that that's what happens. So the exercise is called um, a flow pattern map exercise. It's an Excel file and it's very simple, okay? It should take you not much time to, to make. And you have this map, okay? And it's for uh, upward. Imagine we have a vertical well flowing upward, and we here we have USL and USG, exactly what I explained. Okay, and we are going to say one assumption is that. Okay. The assumption is that the map remains assumption, okay? That's not true. But the assumption is the map doesn't change along the tubing. Okay, that means it's, it's not so affected. by the changes in fluid properties. Okay? That's the assumption. And that's not, you know, it's, it's some, some cases it's a good assumption, some cases it's not a good assumption. Depends how much the density of the liquid change, how much the density of the gas change. So what I'm giving you on top of that is if you go here, you have oil, it's an oil well that uh, I have, you know, I have made my calculations. You, I'm the engineer that gave you the data, okay? I made the pressure calculations and I found in every point in the tubing, uh, the mass flow rate of oil, of the liquid, and the mass flow rate of gas. And I ask you, shouldn't they be constant? The mass rate of oil and the mass rate of gas. Yes or no? Yes. Let's see. Let's look at your phase diagram that you had that class uh, on, on Wednesday. Okay, so we have, you see here we have that, let's make a simple plot to try to see how the data looks like. MO, and here will be TVD. Okay, and when it's zero, it means that I have uh, a smaller value Okay, and when it's 
So here is zero, you have 11.9, and here you have 12.5, okay? That means that the mass of oil is reducing along the tubing. Does that make sense? If you remember what happens in the phase diagram, okay, PT, remember that was something like this, yes, and that you were coming in with this pressure and then you were entering here, you see that at one point, okay, here we have no gas, zero gas. That means that these three points first, I'm here, one, two, and three. But then on the fourth point, and I'm entering here, and actually the oil is splitting into two components, okay? It's gas and oil. And that's why oil starts to reduce and gas is increasing, okay? That's the reason why. Yes? Okay, so I have... Some, you don't ask how I got it, but I got this data for you, okay? No, you, that you will see tomorrow, how we calculate. But basically, I have the density in every point of oil and gas, the mass flow of oil and gas, and I want you to calculate the local rate in each point, and then the superficial velocity of oil and gas. And then, please plot these points in the, in the, in the, on, the, on this flow pattern map. Okay, see how the points, which flow pattern do we have in the well book? If we have slug, if we have churn, etc. And then we have, if you see here, we have another well that is a gas well, okay? And in this gas well, is something different is happening. You have gas, but the gas has water vaporized in the gas. And when the, the pressure is going down, this water is starting to come out, okay? So here, exactly the same thing. The mass of the gas is going down. Okay, and the mass of the water is increasing. Mass of the water. Yeah, this should be the other way. Okay, should be actually this, this, uh, you should put it the opposite. <sighs> Let me select here. So for doing that, you go sort and filter, and you want to sort from smallest to largest. And it should, no, from largest to smallest, okay? Yes, because at the bottom of the tubing, you have very high pressure, and all the water is in the gas phase. And then when you go up, when the pressure goes down, the, gas, the water starts to drop out of the gas. And then you have less gas and more water. Okay? Yes? Okay. So just please do that. You select this data and you say sort from largest to smallest. And uh, please plot, you know, calculate the local rate, the superficial velocity. Remember, that's the rate divided by the cross-section area of the pipe. And then plot it on the flow pattern map, both, okay? Remember, we're going to assume this map doesn't change with properties. And it's the same vertical pipe, it's the same, etc. And then we see which flow pattern we have in each well. Okay? So, so that's um, a very simple exercise. But just to show you that really you can use this uh, flow, flow maps just to tell you what will, be, what will happen in your well. Okay, and that's the first point is the bottom hole. Well, actually, the bottom hole is so undersaturated. And then we go enter into bubble for the oil well. And then we go to um, still in bubble. And then when almost we reach the well head, that's where we have the slug. Okay. And in the case of the gas well, we see initially you have uh, undersaturated gas that is not showing in this plot, but you have um, you have uh, annular, 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 annular until you enter into slug at the end. Okay. So at the end, both of us, both of the wells ended up in in slug. One thing also I want to call your attention is that you remember we. You know, we did uh, some criteria, the Turner criteria, that was to see if the, the well was going to be able to lift the liquid out of the well. If you remember some time ago, last week, we said we make a, a force balance on the droplet 
and we say the force has to be equal to zero, and then we found the velocity. That that's the velocity lifting. Some people now they have been saying for a long time that actually you don't that the the criteria should be not when you have that force in that equilibrium, but actually when you have the transition from annular to slope. That's where you have the problem of liquid load. Okay? Because they say basically that it's not because the liquid loading, so a short comment on liquid loading. Okay, there is an alternative explanation. That is, they say, well, basically, the, the loading is not because is not because of these droplets that I have here in the center. Okay, it's not because of that. I don't have to make a balance in this droplet. It's because of this field that I have here. When the gas rate is not high enough, this film this film will start going down. Okay, and then I will start having these slugs. Okay, and that's they say, well, that's a change in the flow pattern. So some people use, instead of using this criteria, Turner criteria, they use this one that is like uh, wool slippage. That is a transition from annular flow to uh, slug flow. Just, just to, so you're aware of that. And Turner is something that was used for many, many years, but now people are saying, well, actually, Turner is too conservative. When we have droplets and flowing going up, actually, we will never have liquid load. Really, the loading comes is from the wall that you start to, to slip down. And they say, well, we can predict it with that transition. Because Turner will tell you, for example, okay, here you cannot operate. You will have loading. And they say, no, it's not true. Actually, you will be able to go all the way until you reach here. When you have slug is where you have actually this change. So be just be aware of that. <clears throat> okay. So now we go to the heavy part of the class. Okay. Uh, that was explanation. But now I, I want to say a bit about definitions. Okay. And basically, if we look at the pipe, okay, a flow in the pipe, let's see, or let's see, you know, let's make it, uh, I don't think I can turn it. Okay, let's make it like that because we're focusing on a vertical pipe. And we have, okay, let's say we have annular or we have all kind, it, it works with any flow pattern, but let's work with, um, yeah, maybe, yeah. let's choose a bubble, okay. So what you use usually an approach is to say, okay, everything is 1D, okay, in one dimension. Everything, that means everything along the line X. I don't have any other component on the side, everything is 1D, which is a very fair approximation. So if you see at the cross section, okay, if we make a, a cross section cut, okay, you will see that we have something like that, okay, we have something like this, some droplets, and then we have, okay? So what we are going to make, no matter which flow pattern you have, okay? We are going to assign only one velocity to the gas and only one velocity to the liquid. No matter which flow pattern, annular, slug, etc. we're going to say, all of them, we're going to say, are equivalent to, To if I had the following, if I had put all the liquid to one side, 
and all the gas to one side and then I say well all the liquid is traveling at a certain all the gas is traveling at a certain gas velocity and all the liquid is traveling at a certain liquid velocity okay it's an approximation I'm saying I avoid you know I know bubbles might be different velocity but I'm saying finish everything goes at the same velocity okay and I split divide it's like a, an approximation so there are there are two like two main options the liquid and the gas they can go at the same velocity okay VL could be equal to VG okay that's one option that's we say a non-slip condition or also called homogeneous non-slip condition both of them go at the same speed and there is another condition that is non-homogeneous and that is with slip that actually BL is different than BG okay and we are going to see both how does that affect the pipe so both phases they can go at the same speed exactly the same and both can be different <coughs> so let's see I want to calculate okay I want to calculate the area for both cases I want to calculate the area of each phase this cross-section area okay if I see here I will have an area of the gas and here will have an area of the liquid so if I see it from the front I will have something like this something like this and then I say well here I have an area of the gas and here I have an area of the liquid right so I want to find really this area so how how to do it well let's see let's say something okay I know the velocity is the same for both okay they have a velocity that I call the mixture velocity velocity of the gas no slip okay for no slip I say velocity of the gas is equal to the velocity of the liquid that is equal to the velocity of something called mixture okay? so I'm going to say really if I now have I, I can say that the Q of the gas is equal to this area of the gas times the velocity of the mixture right and this Q of liquid is equal to the area of the liquid times the velocity of the mixture. Yes? Okay. Then um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, to um, so how, how do, can I clear here from here these ex two expressions, the mixture uh, velocity? Well, I just summed them, right? So I say Vm times Ag plus Al is equal to Qg plus Ql, right? And then I say that Vm is actually equal to Qg plus Ql over A. That's the cross-section of the pipe, right? And then you recognize something very interesting. What is Qg over A and Ql over A that you just made it now in your exercise? The superficial velocities, right? Superficial liquid velocities and superficial gas velocity. So if, that's an assumption, if the two phases travel at the same time, then the mixture velocity will be equal to the superficial velocity of the gas plus the superficial velocity of the liquid. Okay, if still we, we are not, we... And what will be, so let's make here a definition, okay? We say the void fraction, the void fraction of the gas, okay, is going to be equal to so gas non slip void fraction. Okay, that's a definition. It's equal to the area of the gas divided by the total area of the pipe. Okay. And lambda of the liquid, the same, the non slip. 
And this is not, we don't call it the void fraction for gas, but say liquid non slip hold up. Okay, is equal to the area of the liquid divided by the total area. So I want to know how much will be, for this case, where the velocities are the same, how much will be land of the gas and how much will be land of the, of the liquid. Okay, for a V liquid equal to V gas equal to Vm. Okay, any ideas? How can we, can we calculate the area? Well, we just substitute this that we found here just in this expression, right? And then we can clear out this guy, and then we can do the same here, and we can clear out this guy. Yes? Do you see? Okay, so at the end we find out, so you say, let's call this 1 and 2, and then we substitute um, a Vm equal to usg plus usl in 1 okay and then we end up with qg equal to ag times qg plus ql over a okay and that is equal to so here we have this famous you know lambda g that we wanted is equal to qg over QG plus QL, and for liquid will be the same. Okay, Q lambda of the liquid, the hold up of non slip is equal to Q liquid Q gas plus Q. Liquid. Yeah, that means so. That means if we assume the two phases travel at the same time at the same speed, have exactly the same velocity, homogeneous flow, then to calculate how much each phase is occupying, we just have to make the ratio of the phase uh, volume rate divided by the total volume rate. Okay, and that's a very nice thing because you, like I told you, you know, if you have a piece of pipe, okay, and you want to calculate the hydrostatic delta P, depends on the density of the mixture times G, right? And this density of the mixture depends on how much gas and how much liquid is in this pipe. Okay, so if I assume they travel at the same speed, I can calculate that fraction by just saying equal to lambda G, density of the gas, plus lambda liquid, times density of the liquid. If it's homogeneous, if they travel at the same speed. Okay. Now let's go to the more complicated case, actually, but, okay, we have a small but, but often B of the liquid is not equal to B of the gas, unfortunately, okay? So we cannot make this assumption. So in that case, how does it look like? If we, you know, if we say, so in that case, we call it the uh, void fraction. That we call we design we usually use this letter epsilon times the area of the gas divided by the cross section area and this hold up that is the area liquid hold up of the liquid divided by a okay and now I ask you if if velocity of the if velocity of the gas if we see now in this cross section okay that we were looking at. We have this gas and we have this liquid and one has this velocity and one has this velocity. Okay. What happens if the gas goes quicker than the liquid? Okay, let's say velocity of the gas is bigger than velocity of the mixture. How will the how will be epsilon compared to lambda gas? with the non-slip. The gas now goes quicker, okay? You're still flowing the same amount QL, okay? The same QL. So QL in the in the first in the first case was QL equal to lambda G times um, 
the area of the cross section of the pipe times velocity of the mixture, right? That was for the first case, when everything traveled at the same speed. But now that also has to be equal to the area times this epsilon times this velocity of the gas. Okay, so if this guy is greater than this guy, these two are the same. So that means that this guy has to be less than this one, right? Do you see it? So that means, what does it mean if uh, that actually the gas will occupy a smaller, okay? Which makes sense, okay? Because the gas goes quicker and doesn't need all of that big space to flow in the, in the tubing, okay? It can flow through a much smaller area, okay? And the same thing happens with the liquid. The liquid now, because it goes lower, so it just occupies the whole space. Hmm? That clear? So in that case, E actually is smaller than lambda G. And if the liquid goes quicker, which we are not sure exactly which condition that might be, then, you know, it's, it's the opposite. So we introduced that, the void fraction, and this is the holdup, liquid holdup. Okay. And... Um, so then we call this B, when VL is different than VG, we call the real gas and liquid velocity. Well, actually, we call that always, okay? The only thing is, in one particular case, they are equal to each other. So VL, VG, sorry, and VL are the real gas and liquid velocities okay. then we have that uh, some other definitions is that um, uh, the hold up uh, then we have that b s that's the slip ratio called the slip ratio and that's the ratio between v g over v o and that tells you how quick the gas is going compared to the liquid Okay, this is two times, one time, and we are going to have just now before we finish an exercise and you will see how how that how that's going to look like. Too many exercises today. And you have the relative velocity. And the relative velocity is actually called UR, and that's VG minus VL of the liquid. And you have one more definition that is called the drift velocity and that's um, UD and that's defined as velocity of the gas minus um, the uh, velocity of the mixture okay do I have something else to say here no okay so Going back a bit, a bit, what we did was an abstraction, okay? We have can have any kind of flow patterns in the pipe, bubble, annular, etc. What we say, well, no matter what you have, we're going to say we have only two velocities, one for the gas and one for the liquid. And for that purpose, we're going to put everything, all the liquid on one side of the pipe, and all the, even though it's not like that, but that's how we are going to say, just to assign the same velocity for both, for each one of the phases. Then I say, there are two options. Both of them travel at the same speed. If that's the case, we, it's very nice because we can calculate this lambda has just the ratio between the rates, the volume rates. Okay, The lambda, one we call the void fraction, and that's the area of the cross section that the gas occupies. And the other is the holdup, that is what the liquid occupies. Okay? And then we can just calculate by the ratio between the, the volume rates which is very useful, very nice. The problem is that doesn't happen all the time. What happens is actually they have different velocities. Okay, for example, the gas goes much quicker than the liquid. Um, if that's the case, then I told you we call it the, um, the void fraction, okay, and the liquid holdup. We don't put the word non-slip, we just call it like that. 
And then I told you what happens if the velocity of the gas is greater than the velocity of the mixture. Okay? And then I told you just, you know, by looking at this equation, if this one is bigger than this one, then the gas has to occupy a smaller space in the pipe. That means the void fraction is going to be less. And that's what we call slip. And then there are some other things like slip and that some other definitions. That is, this is indicates how big the gas is compared to the liquid. So let's open the other um, the other exercise. And with that, let's see if we finish. Um, hold up correlation. So this guy, I'm going to I'm going to find the paper here. Was a guy, he, you know, there are many people that try to make correlations, okay? Try to relate, to try to predict exactly this leap, okay, or this holdup. And many people try to say, well, I try to find this holdup of liquid as a function of something, of a bunch of things. And they have defined inclination, diameter, uh, pressure, uh, the densities of the phases of the liquid of the gas, USL, USG, etc. Many people decide what what to what to use, and they still haven't found really a, a good solution. Okay, so we took one of them, one of these guys. This called um, I think it's an Indian name, long name. Where what he did was well, he said it's 2007. Let's see all people that have done this kind of work. Okay, to try to find hold up. All people, and let me show you the table. Is really he made a very nice work. He said all of these people make different. This epsilon is this uh, volume fraction, okay? This uh, void fraction. And then he said we had all of these people from even from the 49, three pages, okay, of correlations, three pages. And he tried to say which one is best, compared with the data. Try to say, it's a big amount of work. Okay, and at the end he said, well, now he said this one is better, etc., blah, blah, blah. But then the guy say, finish. I say, this is the best for everything. This expression, ugly expression, is a, a, for everything. It covers everything what these other guys have to have, are doing. Okay, and that's what we are going to use. You, you, you can use anything you want. You can come to this table and you can say, well, I think for my data, this guy, Kutu, Kutu, Kutu Blue, is going to work better. And I use that. Okay? Then comes uh, Luis, and he said, well, I don't like this guy. I want to use this Dementiev. Okay? Etc. But we are going to use this ugly equation that comes here, and that gives you the... the um, and we are going to see, actually, some values of slip, how much the gas can be quicker than the liquid. Okay? I think that's very, that's very interesting. Well, where, was the, where was the expression? Okay, it's here. So that's the expression we're going to use. And if you see, it depends on, let's see the parameters that it used as an input. Okay. And it uses, and I just chose randomly, okay, this, this um, paper. So use superficial velocity of liquid and gas, okay. It's also using the diameter of the pipe. It's using the surface tension the inclination of the pipe is using and the pressure and the density, density one and density two. So how many parameters is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight parameters. Okay. So we're going to use that. So what I suggest is, um, okay. So you open the file. The file is called. Uh, hold up correlation Volga. Volga is because it's the two name, the names of the two guys. Okay, is called Volde um, Semayat in Gajar. So Volga to make it to make it. Um, okay. Okay. Here you have. So I gave you. This is for again. Some some guy did the calculation. Me. Someone else. They gave you for every position in the tubing, they gave you the local rates. Okay? Like they go, initially you have a little bit of gas, but then it's starting to increase. Hmm? And then I want to calculate all the parameters that I need to evaluate this expression. 
So for that, I need superficial velocities. And then I want you to calculate mixture, lambda g. Um, this lambda is the non-slip. Okay, this is the slip. Here you're going to use that correlation up here. Uh, the area of the liquid, the area of the gas, in each case, real velocities of liquid and gas, relative velocities, and the slip ratio, and this drift velocity. So you're going not, not just, you know, that you, I show you the definition, and then you say, oh, I can go and rest, but actually now you're going to have to calculate each one of these parameters for, for every point in the tube. Okay? And that's going to be your homework. You, you haven't had homework for quite some time, so that's going to be your homework for today. Okay? But let's try to do it. I will do it um, here, and then I will just help you, and then we finish class with, uh, with that. So superficial velocity, remember, is equal to the rate divided by the cross-section area of the pipe. Hmm? So the rate of liquids divided by the cross-section area of the pipe, and then I have to block it. And, but then I have to change units, okay? This is in days and this is in seconds. So I have to divide also by, be careful, I have to divide by 24 times Three, six. You have to check that I'm not doing any mistake. And that remains actually constant. Liquid doesn't change. Okay. Now I go on the gas. The gas I do exactly the same. It will be this number divided by uh, the cross section area of the pipe. Four and then multiply times 3,600 times the first. Sorry, what? The formula here. Just the rate of the liquid, okay, divided by the cross section area. But here it will give me in meters per day. So I have to change the unit, so that's why I divide it also by 24 times 3,600. Yes. Okay? Yes. And then the gas, I do exactly the same. Give me time if you want. So actually, this, not, this is not a tubing. This is like an experiment where I had some liquid flowing in the pipe, and then I start to increase the amount of... Um, uh, the amount of uh, the amount of gas to see how that will affect my my holdup. Okay. And you see that the gas actually is quite high. The liquid remains all the time in one, but actually the gas will be. Uh, yeah, I think another question like when you're working there. What do you think, you know, bubble, how the this hold up? Hold up is how much the liquid is occupying in the pipe. How is the hold up of bubble? And when you move on this direction, what happens with the hold up of liquid? Well, here is, is occupying in bubble is occupying a big space, okay? So probably it's going to be high. And then when you start increasing the speed, actually it's going to be very small because it's going to be just pushed on the walls. Okay, so probably the hold up here is going to be big and here it's going to be small. Yeah, so let's go back to our sheet. Mixture velocity. It will be the velocity if both faces travel at the same, at the same speed. And that is just the sum of the liquid superficial velocity plus the gas superficial velocity, right? That's what we just did. Gas plus liquid superficial velocity. Okay, so that will be just very simple. This one plus this one. So if the two phases here travel at the same speed, they will go at 1.25. And here they will go at 5, and here they will go at 38.77. Okay? 
very simple, but they are not, okay? That's why we have this correlation, to find exactly how quick one goes compared to the other. What is lambda? Lambda G is the area that the gas occupies, right? If you remember, is the area of the gas compared to the total area of the pipe when both are traveling at the same speed. And I told you there is a formula for that. If both go at the same, then lambda of the gas is equal to a rate of gas divided by total rate. Okay, so we do that. Lambda of the gas is equal to the rate of the gas divided by the rate of the gas plus the rate of the liquid. So what does it say? Gas is actually, if both of them go at the same speed, okay, gas will occupy only 6% of the pipe. Okay? And when you go up, actually here it will occupy 97% of the pipe, just because you are circulating more gas into the pipe. Okay, now goes the tricky, the tricky part. Now we have to use that equation to give me the boy, the real boy fraction. Okay, this is not the real. This is just if everything goes at the same speed. Here it will occupy 6%, and here it will occupy 97. But I want to know the real. The, the real, um, you know, how, how much the gas really occupies. So for that, I have to use that correlation. And for that, let's see which function do we have. You know, I need eight inputs, okay? We, we just found now it, it requires eight inputs. User defined. Then we go to what name will it be? Wow, there are a bunch of things here. E. Okay, void fraction of Volga. That's the name, it's with E. Okay, and now we have this eight input. So be patient and you have to fill one by one. Superficial velocity of liquid, this one. Don't block it, I want to drag it down. Superficial velocity of gas, this one. Density of liquid, I have it here and I block it. Density of gas, I have it here. It. Surface tension between gas and liquid, it's here, I block it also, I go down, angle is vertical, okay, so the angle is 90, it's in degrees, block it, pressure of the system, it's here, I uh, block it, and the diameter of the pipe is here, and I also broke it. Yes, I hope I didn't make any mistake and drag it down. So, what does it say? It says here that actually the gas, if it moves at the same speed, the gas will be occupying 6%, right? And now here, the gas is actually occupying more. 7%. That means that is the gas going quicker or slower than the liquid? Slower. Okay, surprise. Why? But let's see the rest. 31 and 29, here is occupying less, so the gas is going quicker, yeah, faster. And it's the same, I think, for all the rest. Okay, so let's calculate here the area that, that the liquid is occupying in the cross section of the pipe. Okay, so that will be. How much? Well, the holdup of the liquid, right, is just 1 minus the void fraction, right? That I think that we didn't do here, but uh, let's do it very quickly. So if you say that E, okay, that E is equal to the area of the gas over total area, and H holdup is equal to area of the liquid, divided by total area, okay? So then if you sum both of them up, okay, E plus HL should be equal to AG plus AL over A, which is equal to 1. 
Yeah, that means that hold up of the liquid is equal to one minus E. Okay, so that's what we are going to use here. The area of the liquid is equal to one minus this one okay. times the area that I block. And then I drag it down. And the area of the gas will be just simply the void fraction times the cross section area. Okay. Not much very exciting this uh, this task. Okay, how much the liquid is occupying and how much the gas is occupying. You see the gas occupies very little and the liquid occupies um, Okay, now go, comes the really the, the interesting part, the velocities of the phase, the real velocities of the phase. So how do I calculate the real velocity of the phase of liquid and gas? Well, I have already the area, right? And I have also the rate that is supposed to circulate by this area. So what about just dividing this rate by this area and this rate by this area? This will give me the real phase velocity. Right? Yes or no? Yes? AL? AL here? It's 1 minus the void fraction times the cross section area of the pipe. And this is just the void fraction times the cross section area of the pipe. Okay, so this velocity is equal to the rate of liquid divided by the, the area of the liquid. But remember, we have to change units because we want it in meters per second. We have to multiply 24 times 3, 600. I'm almost to go, right? Area of the liquid. Okay, here of the liquid. Okay, and now I go with the area of the gas. Of the gas divided by this number. Area of the gas times twenty four times three is six hundred. Okay, and you see here that basically here they go very similar velocity, but after that actually the, the gas goes much, much quicker than the liquid. Okay, I think we are close to... You want to finish the exercise or let's do it tomorrow? Finish. Finish, okay. So far, so good? Yeah, more or less? Okay, so let's, let's recap. We calculated superficial velocities because that's what we need for the correlation, okay, for this big correlation. We need eight parameters, but we need superficial liquid and superficial gas velocity. Here we had to make a change of units that was not so nice, but okay. So we divided the rate by the cross-section area. Now the velocity of the mixture, by definition, that we just found in class, say is the sum of both. Okay, it's the sum, where is it? Of the superficial velocity of the gas plus the superficial velocity of the liquid. Um, yeah, now uh, this lambda is the non-slip, okay, um, non-slip void fraction, and the non-slip void fraction is this one, lambda g, and is the volume rate of gas divided by the total volume rate. Okay, so I calculated here the volume rate of gas divided by the volume rate of gas plus the volume rate of liquid. 
Now, here I use this correlation okay, with these eight parameters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I hope I didn't make any mistake here. And that gives me actually, the gas always goes quicker than the liquid. Well, here it goes slower, right? Slower, but here it goes quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. Mm -hmm. Now I calculated with that, the cross-section area times one minus this number, it gives me the area of the liquid. The cross-section area times this number, the void fraction gives me the, 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 what, how, the area through which the gas is flowing. Then to calculate the real velocity, I then say, well, this is nothing less than the, the flow rate of the liquid divided by the actual area that the liquid is flowing through. Okay? And the gas is just the, the rate of the gas divided by the cross-section area through which the gas is flowing. Yes? Relative velocity. Do you remember what was the definition? Uh, relative velocity is here. Vg minus Vl. Okay. So you say Vg minus Vl. Okay. And that exactly confirms our suspicion. Initially, the liquid is going faster than the gas, but then the gas starts to go much, much faster than the liquid. S, what is S? The slip ratio is the relationship between velocity of gas and velocity of liquid. Here should be S1 divided by S1. Initially, it should be less than 1, and it becomes bigger than 1 times, okay, 2.3 times the gas is flowing quicker than the liquid. And then the drift velocity, that the drift velocity is the velocity of the gas minus the mixture velocity. Velocity of the gas minus the mixture velocity. So initially, again, the gas is going slower than the mixture. After that, it's going actually quicker. Yes? This one? This one? This one? Is the um, UG minus UM. That's the drift velocity. Okay? Yes. UR is equal to the difference of velocity between the phases. Okay, so I'm going to copy this here in the um, the exercise. Today were, I think, uh, a lot of exercises. Okay, let's see, paste. Okay, that's the solution. I hope it's okay. You can do quality control and check. But then the inter interesting thing is this plot that tells you the slip ratio versus, um, well, not, not the slip. I wanted to plot is um, okay. If if let's let's look here at the. Um, Okay, if I plot now, I want to plot based on this data, if I want to plot how the gas void fraction, what will happen with USG? Okay, actually what I'm doing, okay, what I'm doing here, I'm, say, I'm saying USL, okay, we see it in a flow pattern map. Okay, USL is constant, is all the time 1.17, okay, and I'm changing USG from 0 0.08 all the way to, um, how much is that? 37, right? 0.59. So 
So I'm moving along this line here. Okay, and if you remember, what was the flow pattern, how the flow pattern looks like for vertical pipes? It had something like this, it had something like this, it had something like this, and I had something like this. Okay, right, and this one was bubble, this one was dispersed bubble, this one was log, and this one was churn, and this one was annular. Okay. What happens along this line? How does the the EPS, the the void fraction changes? Here is around seven percent, right? And here it goes all the way to uh, seven percent is here, and then here goes to ninety-three percent. You see, and it makes total sense because you have, if initially when you have bubble, okay, you have the gas is really occupying only small cross section, okay, compared to the liquid. The liquid is occupying a big cross section. And if you see it from the side, this would mean that actually the liquid is occupying something like that. That means epsilon equal to 7%. Okay. When you move, that's for point one. When you move now to point two, you will have annular flow. Right, and in this annular flow, actually, the gas is occupying a big, big volume of the pipe, and the liquid is occupying only a small portion of the pipe. If you see from the cross section, you will see basically that gas is something like this, and liquid is only something like that. That means that epsilon is equal to 97 percent. Okay. Nice. Okay. It, it takes a long time to do the exercise, but at the end you get some very nice uh, observations. Okay. So the, your homework is to deliver the same exercise, but please you have to give me the plot of S versus USG. Okay. And also S versus um, S versus a, a hold up, okay, which is 1 minus epsilon. Okay, so you have to generate these two plots and tell me uh, how, how do they look like. Okay, that's a homework. Okay. So let's make a very quick recap. We said tables. Okay, we use uh, we use tables just looking at the tubing inlet and outlet. This is very interesting, but we have to make a lot of simulations to capture the complexity of the curve. Then we said we went to this pressure traverse curve. Basically, the delta p is just a function of the pressure if you keep everything else constant. But then you have to have you know, a curve for every condition. And that was actually in the original paper by Gilbert. He gave, this is his paper, okay, this guy Gilbert. And he basically shows, uh, you know, a collection of these curves for different tubing sizes, for different rates, for different gas liquid ratio. And people were using that, this was in 54, okay? So people were using that for a long time. Then we said multiphase flow complicated to make a dimensional numbers. We cannot do the same, but we use these flow pattern maps that we have something very useful called the superficial velocity. And we can define with this superficial velocity, these flow patterns that they are going to be very important. You will see later to calculate pressure drop. Uh, and then we made an exercise to see how the, the, the point moves along the tubing, okay, for an oil well and a gas well and how actually the flow pattern changes. And then we made, I introduced the definitions that are fundamental, okay? This is the minimum you have to know in multiphase flow. This void fraction, hold up, a homogeneous flow, mixture velocity, real phase velocity. This is the minimum that you have to know. And then we made an exercise to see how actually, you know, the, 
the, the, the void fraction changes when we increase the gas velocity. Okay, any question? Yes? Pressure? No. Uh, here? No. Is equation? No. Here? Yes. Yeah, this should be also H. The length, the distance of the. That's correct. Okay, see you tomorrow.